Okay, hi, thank you everybody for, for being here at, the, at this, uh, this late hour. Um, uh, we're going we're gonna to keep you here for another 30 minutes or so, I hope, at least. Um, so I'm Brommert, I work as a data scientist uh, at Booking.com. I'm here together with Luca, my colleague. Um, and before we start, how many people have heard of Booking.com? Just to check. That's really great. That's a lot, a lot more than I expected, because we're, we're not that big in, uh, on this side of the world. Um, so for the people who haven't heard of us, um, so we're one of the largest travel e-commerce companies in the world. We have about 15,000 employees spread out over well, um, a lot of offices, about half the world. Um, most of those are actually people that talk with hotels or talk with our customers. I think tech is about maybe 2,000 people. Um, we have 130,000 destinations, and each day we serve about 1.5 million room nights. So that's, if you reserve two rooms, that's two room nights. Um, or two rooms for one night, it's, it's two room nights. Um, so we have a, a decent-sized business um, and, and a lot of data to work with. Um, a small outline of the talk. Uh, I'll, I'll start with um, describing how, how data science works at Booking, um, what, how, how we view the machine learning pipeline, um, I'll talk about how we do our offline machine learning and uh, how we then move towards online model serving. Um, we'll talk a bit about model and feature monitoring and discoverability. Um, and uh, we're going to end with sort of the future directions. Where do we want to be in, uh, in the near future? So let's start with data science. So we have a community of about 200 data scientists at Booking. Um, each has different needs, different expertise, different preferred toolkits, and uh, uh, different methodologies, different ways of working. Um, and we really do not want to um, um, pr prevent uh, uh, our, our users, our data scientists, to do the, their work in the way that they prefer to do their work. Um, and well, the mission of, of my team and my track, um, together with Luca, is, is to help these people sort of do their job and to, to make sure that even if we grow to, to 400 or 500 data scientists, not that that's a reality, um, well, that they can still do whatever they want to do, right? So how do we do that? Um, we start by identifying uh, common problems. Like, um, I want to build um, um, my feature in such a way that it's historically correct, right? I don't want to use the number of bookings that someone made today, but I want to have the number of bookings that someone made uh, the moment that my, my data point was created. Um, so then we, we, we implement tooling, we implement infrastructure to help solve these problems for, for our data scientists. Um, and then we train and educate uh, and sometimes also consult uh, our, our users on these solutions, right? And our users in this case are, are people within Booking um, that use our tools. Um, so the machine learning pipeline, right? Um, generally in Booking, whenever someone does a machine learning project, it follows about this, this route, right? It starts with a problem uh, formulation. Let's say that you want to predict whether someone that made a booking is going to cancel that booking or not. Um, so you start with getting basic, basic training data. You start with getting instances, um, dimensions, so you, the, the features, uh, and the labels. In this case, did someone sort of actually stay their reservation or not? Um, you try to enrich this with sort of uh, features that um, we already know, or maybe you want to build um, some new features. Um, maybe you want to do some, some encoding. You want to transform the features in some way. Um, and then you want to build a model um, using whatever library you want. And in booking in general, there's there's H2O, there's TensorFlow, and there's, there's a library called Vobble Webit that we use. Um, and then that's about the offline sort of pipeline. Um, then on the online side, um, well, you have to construct your features uh, in real time, right? Um, that's not always an easy thing and might sometimes be the thing that takes most of the time uh, that it takes to get your model uh, online. Um, you want to publish your model, make sure that it, it, it sort of lives in our uh, model serving service. Um, together with sort of the transformations that you've applied uh, and, and the, well, the list of features that you need. Um, you want to set up some kind of real-time or uh, a batch prediction mode, depending on where in, in, our, um, or in our world your model is going to be used, whether it's going to be on, on the front end, on the website, or maybe somewhere in the back end for, I don't know, our, our hotel department to, um, to, to prioritize their work. Um, and then, well, when the model is running, you want to monitor it, uh, both the model itself, what it outputs, and also sort of what comes in, so the features and, and, and whether they're still healthy and, and the way that you expect them to be. So let's dive a little bit further into the offline part of machine learning and booking. So generally, our website runs on, on MySQL. 
Um, so all the data that you, you see when you log in comes from, from those databases. Um, and we dump, every night we dump a, a copy of those into, uh, into Hadoop. And we have a large uh, event stream that's also being sort of uh, captured and uh, pushed to Hadoop that we can then use to, to build sort of more behavioral features. Um, then we build something within our team we call Feature Vader. Um, not, not Feature Vader, but Feature Vader. Vader is a Dutch word for uh, father. Um, and uh, that contains sort of the instance retrieval, so retrieving all the instances uh, on which you want to train, gathering features, and sort of doing feature transformations. Uh, and then you can push that, and it's all built on top of Spark. And you can push that to um, um, the modeling library that you want to use. So there's a, a couple of requirements that, um, that we have in, in sort of on the offline data munching side. So we want to be able to extract relevant features from, from, from the events that we have. Right? Generally, the events come in in, a, uh, in an unstructured way. So you somehow need to put some structure on that uh, before you can, you can efficiently query it. Um, you want to be able to do feature engineering. Right? Um, you want to have time coordinate matching. As I said, you want to have features that are historically correct. Um, and you want to be able to scale this to billions of rows um, without your data scientist having to wait a few days before his data set is ready to, uh, to work with. Um, and it, um, it needs to be easy to use as well. Right? You don't want someone to have to follow a 10-day course before they can start to build their own, own features. So Feature Vader um, looks like this. Uh, it's a custom Spark ML transformer. Um, you can generate a data set or create a data set of, of instances. Um, you start up Feature Vader. You tell it, well, this is the column that represents time. Um, these are the features that I want. Uh, and then you transform it. Uh, and then it takes a data frame on the left, and it sort of outputs a data frame on the right that has the features, or enriched with the features that you want. Right? So it's as simple as that. But then you're not done yet. Right? So generally, the raw features that you, you collect are not enough. Um, transformations of these features generally increase the model performance a lot. Right? You can do simple things like standardizing, so making sure that the mean is at zero and the standard deviation is at one. You can do things like bucketizing a, a numerical variable and make it into a categorical variable. Uh, you can do something like target encoding, uh, like take a categorical variable and, and, and transform it into a numerical value that somehow encodes its relationship with the, the label, the thing you're trying to predict. Uh, this is way too small to see what's next. Um, and um, a lot of these features have some form of state, right? So when, when you do the standardization, you need to somehow store the mean and the standard deviation um, and make sure that if you use that same transformation uh, online, uh, well, you do the transformation in the exact same way. So something that we're, we're building at the moment is, is a way to take a, a Spark ML pipeline and transform it into an object that you can actually sort of serve real time online um, with as, uh, as little dependencies as possible. Um, and again, we tried to make it as simple as possible. So there's a pipeline writer object that just takes whatever pipeline you have and you write it out. Um, for the modeling part, there's several libraries that we use at Booking. Um, so there's h2o.ai, um, if we have to work with large amounts of data um, and want to build um, um, a little bit more complex models than linear models. Um, there's TensorFlow that we use for, for deep learning approaches. And there's VobelWebit. I'm not sure. How many people know VobelWebit? So it's, something that's quite popular with us. It's basically an, an online out of core machine learning library that, um, that goes over your data one by one. So generally what you do is you take your big data set, you sample it to something that, is, that fits on disk. It doesn't have to fit in memory, but it needs to fit on disk. Uh, and then you stream over it once or twice or three times and, and build your model that way. Um, um, all right, and this is the point where I give the speaker or the, the thing to, uh, to my colleague, Luca. All right. Yep. Great. Um, so, as Brahmar said, we usually allow quite some flexibility to people to build their models. Um, but we thought that for this specific conference and audience, since we're talking about Spark, it would be relevant to talk about H2O. Why? Because H2O comes uh, out of the box with a library, which is called Sparkling Water. And by the way, I see Kuba, that is one of the core developers there. Um, and uh, it's pretty nice, um, Sparkling Water, because it puts together a nice integration between H2O and Spark. And in our experience, it allows to get the best out of both worlds. 
So for us, Spark is really the place or the framework where we come in when we want to do all the data managing, all the data cleanup and preparation of features before training a model. And then what we can do with the Sparkling Water API is like once that we have packaged a nice data frame, we can ship it over to the cluster of nodes uh, that are uh, creating the H2O cloud, and we can do the training of the models there. Uh, H2O is scalable to a very large data set. We, we proved in the past, like with billions of rows. It does distributed training. Um, and what is also interesting for us is this final bullet point here. So this difference between internal and external backend mode. Let me explain a bit more this one. So historically at Booking, uh, the model that we have is like, we have a big data warehousing um, cluster, so a big share Hadoop clusters, um, which is uh, managed through uh, Yarn as the resource manager uh, with fair scheduler. And that means that all the users comes up and submit their own queries, as well as schedule workflows and jobs to train their models or build their data. Um, since this is shared among all the users, we have problem with contention of resources. And specifically, when new jobs comes in which have a higher priority than what you're doing, you may, there is a mechanism which is called preemption and will kill some of your containers that are running, some of your Spark executors, to make space for something else that has a higher priority. Um, and this was problematic in the beginning because H2O ships with this internal backend mode in which every H2O node sits in the same spot as the Spark Executor JVM. So we're running in the same JVM. And H2O is not high availability. So if you lose one H2O node, it means that the, your world training is gone and you need to start from scratch. So what we built together with H2O was this uh, new cluster mode, exter external cluster mode, in which what you can do is that instead of having the H2O nodes living together with the Spark Executor, they can be scheduled and started into a dedicated yarn queue, which you can mark as not preemptible. And that means that now we can use dynamic allocation on Spark to do all the data managing, ship over the data to the H2O cloud that will be untouched, and the training can go smooth and the model can be built. That was what we wanted to share today about how we build model in the offline world, so in the Hadoop world. Um, how about productionizing our models? So the data scientist has hopefully built their features, their model, it's time to try to put it in production. How do we do that? As you can see from this slide, it's a process that has two lanes. So there is tasks that are usually for developers and tasks that are for data scientists. What is for the developers is mostly reconstructed the features online. Why that? Because offline, what we get is like tables. Uh, we have a dedicated event system in Booking that um, collects all sorts of unstructured data that flows into our data warehousing system, and we do processes on top of that to get the tables. But online, we don't have these tables. Online, we have small chunks of data, small streams of data, which are structured schemas. Um, and we need to process this data as it comes in to recreate the correct aggregation for the features. We may have streams, for example, about hotel impressions, so pages that the people click on the website, or about the searches that the person perform on the website. And we want to aggregate those. And for b building meaningful features for machine learning, we provide a component, our track provides a component, which is called Feature Mappers. It's basically a Spark streaming application. Um, and once that the de uh, developers have re-implemented these features, they can register them into the feature store. So the feature store is a component that contains all the bindings to both offline features and online features. And the nice thing about this is that it's a collection of implementation of features. So as soon as one developer implements certain features and he makes it available in the store, everyone can immediately reuse it without having to go through development effort. So it tries to maximize reusal of features. So this is the lane for the developers, as we said. For the data scientists, we have a self-service tool where people can jump in and say, hey, I've trained my model. It's here with a set of transformation. It uses this list of features online. Um, just upload the model. It's a self-service tool. They click a bunch of buttons, and in half an hour, the model is live. And now we'll, go, we'll dive through each one of these components that I quickly presented in this slide. So we'll start with the feature mappers. It has a few requirements. The first one is that since information in the streams comes continuously, and we have significant traffic on the website, uh, we need a nearly real-time processing. So we need a, a framework that is able to handle streams and to scale properly. Second, we want to support different kind of transformation here. We want to support what we call stateless transformation. Let's say I have a stream, and I want to get only uh, the searches that 
are looking at properties in Italy. This is a stateless transformation. And then we have stateful transformation. For example, I may want to get an aggregation that uh, for every single hotel page tells me how many people have visited it in the last 10 minutes. Here, I'm forced to keep a state about this information. Next, um, as I said, traditionally we have this big share cluster where we schedule jobs, but these streaming applications were long running and they shouldn't be killed because, I mean, they're just continuously processing information. So what we created is actually a containerized application in this case. We have a separate infrastructure with containers where we schedule this streaming application. And finally, if we can process this information fast enough, but you cannot serve it back fast enough, it means that it defeats the whole purpose because the features cannot be used in production and they could not be used um, to be looked up before doing pre uh, for doing prediction and online refer inference, meaning that while people are browsing the website, we would like to do prediction on what we should recommend next or what we should modify next. So it's important to have nearly real-time serving. This is how the architecture of the solution looks like for the feature mappers. As you can see, the input part is like uh, this application consumed a set of streams. Uh, we have Kafka that powers the, this infrastructure with steam, streams. So you can think of it about, uh, this could be all the streams that are related to hotel impression or about searches. Um, and then the actual Spark streaming application uses the streams, it uses the streams API. Um, it collects and it gets everything into an input stream. People can apply transformation, both stateless and stateful, because Spark streaming API provides both of these transformation. Um, and then they can generate their features. And this is what you see here, Mark as output. And then two things usually happen. The person can ever put these messages back into Kafka. Um, and this is usually used for monitoring the quality of the messages that we generate or the rate of the, the amount of messages that you generate. Or for connecting different feature mappers one to each other because you may put messages into one and then create a new feature mapper that reads from that specific Kafka topic. Um, the problem here is that this Kafka per se is not a durable persistent storage. So if you want to use the features later on, you need to put this into something that is durable. And in our use case, what we used was Cassandra. Um, for obvious reason, it's a NoSQL database, so it's a bit more relaxed in the um, guarantees that it gives to you, but it's horizontally scalable, it's distributed, and if you do your data modeling consciously, it gives you really good um, performance when you're retrieving back the features, meaning that you can get back a feature from a Cassandra table in a bunch of milliseconds, making it possible for us to get all the features that are available send them back and get predictions back that we can use to customize uh, behavior for the user in the session while we're browsing the website. Next, we build all of our features, we have registered them in the feature store. How do we serve models? So we have uh, um, a model service, um, which is built in-house. It supports several types of models, mainly H2O, Wopal Wabbit, TensorFlow. Um, it allows both single point predictions and also batch. So you can submit multiple rows for which you want to get a prediction and you will get it back. And it has integration with the feature store for, with the online bindings, which means that data scientists can just say, hey, this is my model. This is the set of features by name that are defined and are registered in the store. And then automatically we will do their role. When the person wants to do a prediction, we will get the corresponding values of all the features that are required. And I'll show this with a, a small diagram here. Um, so let's say that the data scientist has built already their model. Uh, for this use case, we consider like the person has built an H2O model where you have this kind of Mojo object. It's a set of compiled Java classes. It's convenient because it doesn't have the core of Spark, neither the core of H2O. It's just a set of Java classes, so it's very easy to, and very quick for doing predictions. Um, together with the Bojo, which is the outcome of the transformation that we may have defined offline. Um, what Brammer mentioned before, we can generate a pipeline of transformations and then have them, the very same code being applied online so that we don't have to implement the transformation from scratch. So these two usually comes together because the transformation may be connected directly with the model. Uh, the data scientist just comes in and he said, okay, I want to upload a new version of my model. These are the transformation also. Uh, the model sits here in HDFS. When the model service, what we'll do is like, you will just pull from HDFS both the model and the transformation, deploy it to the model, all the model uh, uh, workers, service workers, and then we can start accept requests. 
the person or the caller will provide which model they want to get a prediction for, as well as the required input keys. Um, automatically, given the model name, we know the list of all the features that are connected with it. So we can go to the feature store and say, hey, give me back all the features for this model. And gets, uh, they get automatically enrolled and, co and computed on the, on the spot. And then this payload is passed over to the service coordinator, which then can go to one of the workers and compute the actual prediction and return it back to the caller. Right, so we've seen how we productionize models, both for the features and the model. Um, now let's see and let's talk a bit about how people can monitor the quality and reuse and discover which models and features are available. So we have a, a web application, a portal, both for models and for features that collects a bunch of metadata across all the different products that we, uh, all the components that we've shown so far, so feature mappers, feature vader, and uh, the model serving service. Um, and the first UI that is important is the tool to update the model, to upload the model. So as you can see here, people can just say, okay, this is on this specific Hadoop cluster at this HDFS path, that's where the model is sitting. This model is of this type, and then just click the upload button, and in 20 minutes, 30 minutes, the model is online on all the boxes and can already start receiving live traffic. The next thing that comes out of this model portal, which is very nice, is monitoring for your model. So we sample both, um, we sample some, all the calls that happens on the model service so that we know which features were passed in as well as what was the final output label or the output pr probability. And we can group all of these together and provide this kind of uh, UI to the user where, for example, you can see uh, the probability distribution function of both the output classes of the model and of all the features. Uh, this is nice because the person can see over time, for example, how the model changed the shape. And this can hint if maybe there is like some problem in the quality of the features degrading over time or of the model as well and may need to be retrained. Next and final uh, bit for the model portal is that we have a search bar, of course, in which data scientists can just come in and say, hey, how many, mo what, what, how many models are available? Who is, uh, it is also shown for each model who is the owner of the model. So if you have questions about that specific model, you can just go and ask. Um, as well as what is the status of the model. So if the model is deployed, if the model is still under testing, if the model is ready for, for being called in production. Um, and it also gives you the list of the experiments that are currently using this model. As for the feature, we have something very similar. So again, we have a search bar on top. People can start typing and check which features are available in the store. Um, for each feature, we have a description explaining the specific implementation. We have an owner once again, so that if you need to get more details about the specific features, you can just go ask to this person. Um, and we may have different implementation. We may have the offline implementation and the online implementation. And you see it marked here with this uh, badges symbol on the side. Uh, and this is interesting because if an offline and online implementation of um, a feature is available, it means that it is immediately reusable by any, every data scientist without requiring any development effort, which means that, well, this is a feature that I can reuse for free in my models. So after uh, discussing a bit about the monitoring, uh, about the feature direction, so what we would like to do next, um, all of these components, they, we are building them. We are in the process of building them and testing out and rolling, lead, rolling them out in our organization. Some are more mature, some are less. Um, so we want to make the full pipeline smoother for having faster iteration for the data scientists that are working here in our organization. Also, in our case, in booking case, the problem that we have is that we have a, a limited amount of developers' hands that we can put to help out data scientists. So what our track is really focusing and putting a lot of effort is try to uh, automatize most of the tasks that are developers related so that our data scientists are not blocking their day-to-day -day job. And an example of this is, for example, um, at the moment the implementation of the features online is usually a job that is done by the developers. So we would like in the future to, given a certain uh, offline implementation of a feature done with Feature Vader, automatically parse this configuration and generate the corresponding feature mappers for recreating the same uh, features online using streams of data. So this is something that we would like to start tackling in the future. 
With that said, we would really like, I think, both me and Brammer to thank you for joining our talk. Um, booking is growing a lot, as Brammer say. Um, so we're always looking for new hands and people that would like to, to help out. Uh, so if you're interested, please just check out the link. And we both also will be here for the rest of the conference. So we're happy to take any question. Hi, uh, hey. thanks for the talk. Um, can you talk a little bit about the internal versus external mode um, in, when you're running in production? What was the issues you're having? Right. Um, so the, the issue with the external, the H2O mode, I suppose uh, you're talking about. The H2O, yeah. Uh, so the problem is, that is that we have preemption enabling our cluster because we have a lot of users. So if you're starting your job for doing a training, for example, if a workflow that is higher priority kicks in, your job may be killed, or executors may be killed. And in default sparking, sparkling water uh, mode, um, if you lose any of your executor, it means that you also lose one of the H2O nodes, and then it means that the whole training is broken, and you will have to redo it from start. So will Spark, spark cluster come down as well, or is it is causing to? No, it's just the H2O cluster. H2O cluster. But it means that you cannot train your model, right? Okay, or so you will have to restart from scratch. You're losing whole work, entire work, right? Sorry? You're basically losing the whole flow. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Which is why it's nice to have this external mode. So in the architecture, I saw you guys are using Cassandra for storing feature stores. Yeah. Uh, so for the offline thing, uh, so use Cassandra. And then once you compute the online features, they get added up to Cassandra again. Feedback? Uh, no, usually it's like two separate parts. We really have this distinction between offline and online. So the feature vader part, so the computation of the features online, just works on Hive using Spark okay. mostly. So we do the, all the data munching, we recompute uh, for every single feature the list of the kind of a fact log saying how the feature changed over time, and then we dump everything back into Hive. So this is for the offline world. Online world, instead, we process streams, we use Spark streaming. And then once we have the actual uh, aggregation, we dump everything into Cassandra. And is that working good for you guys? Because let's say if uh, you guys are doing a user feature store with like 200 aggregated columns, whether it's some averages, all that, and uh, do your users actually use like few columns, that's why it's working great? Or is it like they pull everything uh, when they want to do offline training? So I, I think. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I think at the moment it's it's working fine for us, also because people use a few columns, because um, yeah. we're still in the process of sort of sort of writing one feature mapper for one one uh, online feature takes time, um, and we're still in the process of sort of um, scaling scaling that up as well, right? To, to to train people to build their own features so that we don't have we're a small team, so we we provide the tooling and then uh, the our data scientists and developers go out and actually build the features that they need. Hi, thank you for the presentation. Yep. Uh, I have a question regarding to the implementation of the H2O. So uh, could you talk about how long time you use H2O and uh, how hard that things can be deployed into a certain environment? I guess it's a on-prime cluster you guys are maintaining right now, right? Right. So it's not uh, a in cloud environment, right? Right. So mostly traditionally, we did things on-premise so far. Uh, so we have this big cluster with 10,000, some more machine. We have uh, three or four of them. Um, and yeah, H2O, in that case, we've been using it, I would say, for one year and a half now. Yeah. Um, building models like, yeah, like especially random forest, it's very particularly used in our organization. Um, yeah, I would say that's. Does that answer your question, or is uh, there more specific? The only thing left out would be like how hard to deploy that H2O. Um, Kind of framework. But, but by deploying it, you mean making sure that our data scientists can use it, or yeah. deploying it in online in the? Yes, make sure you can use it into production. I guess you can answer that one better. Yeah, um, no, it's actually going quite quite smoothly. I would say we have uh, some problems that we see sometimes, like again because of the scale of the organization. So sometimes we may have uh, contention or resources, but uh, for. Training models, I think it works pretty well for us. Okay. 
Cool. Hi. Thank you. Um, uh, just a question on the deployment front. Uh, when you execute your models, do you have like some custom framework that you have built, or because you have model coming from different like Pojo, Mojo, Bojo? Yep. So what, have you guys built something in house, or you are using some open source framework? Right. No. So we we have something in house, um, which is basically. Um, a Scala service, which is this model serving uh, service that I was talking about. It's a Scala server with, with some common um, interface for models. And then what we do is like we embed the different models and we respect the interface. So for example, for a Pojo or a Mojo, you can just load it into the, the same, or put it onto the same uh, box as the workers, and then use Java Reflection to load the class inside of the Mojo, and you can just call it back, right? Okay. Thank you.